Welcome back all to uh, Competing on Analytics. Um, we had a great day today, a lot of great speakers um, in this track, uh, part of the Data Summit Connect. Uh, um, and uh, we hope, uh, if you've been attending the previous sessions, we hope you've been able to gather a lot. There was certainly a lot of information and a lot of good advice and uh, uh, the word on trends occurring in the market. And to wrap things up, um, we're going to hear from Justin Borgman. He's co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Starburst, based in Boston. And prior to founding Starburst, he was vice president and general manager at Teradata. So let's uh, hear from Justin on X Analytics, a new approach to data that's accelerating digital transformation. Hi. I'm Justin Borgman, CEO and co-founder of Starburst. Today, we're going to talk about how to drive digital transformation faster with X Analytics. Before we get started, a quick introduction about myself. Prior to founding Starburst, I was a VP and GM at Teradata, where I led a team focused on emerging technologies, thinking about the future of data warehousing analytics. I came to Teradata through the acquisition of my first startup called Hadapt, which was an early pioneer in the SQL and Hadoop space. We were focused on bringing data warehousing analytics to the data lake. I was fascinated at the time by the idea of freeing customers from the vendor lock-in associated with traditional data warehousing vendors. That's why after arriving at Teradata, I got involved with a new open source project with roots at Facebook, now called the Trino project. Trino provides lightning fast SQL query results, regardless of where the data lives, no matter if it's in a data lake, data warehouse, or something else entirely. In 2017, Starburst was born from the creators of that project, largely to help companies achieve what I'm going to talk about today. For a quick orientation, today we're going to cover what's driving the need for X-Analytics as a means to accelerate digital transformation. Then I'll explain what X-Analytics is and the benefits seen by companies taking this approach. Lastly, I'll get a bit more technical and we'll talk about how to build an X-Analytics architecture. So let's get started. This may sound familiar to some of you in the audience, but the COVID pandemic has created a trend, a significant shift in the way that consumers participate in a variety of industries. Digital adoption and banking has increased from 51 to 73%, entertainment from 40 to 64%, and perhaps most dramatically, grocery has been nearly doubled in terms of the digital adoption of consumers in those industries. And all of this has vaulted us forward perhaps five years in terms of consumer and business digital adoption. All of that, of course, is creating more data and a greater need to analyze that data. In a way, the current wave of digital transformation resembles how physicians respond to acute medical conditions with rapid and dramatic interventions designed to stabilize the patient and lessen immediate severity of the condition. Gartner says, organizations simultaneously grappling with the challenge that pandemic-induced behavioral and economic shifts have rendered some historical data useless and goes on to say that the combinatory power of more sophisticated and complex analytics on a greater variety of data has become required to innovate our way beyond the post-COVID-19 world. So now we understand the imperative and that companies need faster access to new data and new combinations of data. That's really where X Analytics comes in. So what is X Analytics? Well, it was a term coined by Gartner to mean the delivery on the promise of the big data era that achieved the ability to store and manage content, but fell short of enabling analysis of a broad range of content and use cases at scale. That is to say, it's really the combination of your core data that you've collected for years with new data. And that's ultimately what X Analytics is all about. McKinsey goes on to say that senior executives will need ready access to both new and newly critical data to make unprecedented decisions in the short term and inform adjustments to their business strategies and operational plans in the medium to long term. So who is running X Analytics today? FINRA is one of our favorite examples. FINRA is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, and they were running an out-of-date architecture and needed to more easily join data sets to achieve a faster pace of data access and analysis. This was simultaneous to a shift to the cloud from a number of legacy on-prem data warehousing solutions to more of a cloud data lake model. 
And today, they use Starburst to allow 200 plus users to quickly analyze 25 petabytes of data using ad hoc SQL queries and Tableau to do exactly that. The result is FINRA can now efficiently monitor activity for trading fraud on 25 petabytes of data, both new data coming in every day, 100 billion rows every day, along with the data that they already have archived across 25 different data sources. Another great example is Emus Health in the UK, a leading healthcare technology firm. The chief analytics officer was brought in to leverage more data to unlock new revenue streams. Their challenge was that that data federation wasn't possible across the different data sources that they had, and they had no ability to present that in a secure manner in a self-service portal. The solution is they deployed Starburst, along with role-based access control, to provide access across 5,000 different databases, and now to support dynamic filtering and provide access across all of these different data sources and enable enhanced predictive analytics to improve the healthcare of their customers. I wanted you to hear from Richard Jarvis, the Chief Analytics Officer for Mimas, in his own words. Here's a short video. Emis is a healthcare IT company, very large in the UK, where we provide software that doctors, pharmacists, people in hospitals use. The total number of patients in our system is about 40 million, but we have a history of patients that goes back um, a very long time. So there's probably 120 million or so patient records in our, uh, in our data lake. Today, the world is populated by lots of unstructured data. There are people having more and more complex diseases. The best and potentially only way to treat some of those is to collect and make accessible data for clinicians to use so that they can really understand what's going on in a patient's life and their treatment. There are many different people who have an impact on your healthcare. So when you go and work out in your gym, you might be collecting information about your health. When you're wearing your smart fitness tracker, uh, that has information that might be relevant to your health. Your pharmacist, your doctor, visits to the hospital can all collect information about your healthcare record. The journey that we're on is enabling a platform to collect all that information together and have the scale to process it so that you can quickly get the insights from all those different spaces at once. But with an analytics platform where you can understand the full history of a patient, you can compare that to clinical trials and data that's been collected across thousands or millions of patients. We needed to move away from a, a siloed, uh, hosted environment and into a much more uh, wide-ranging cloud environment with capabilities that could uh, bring data in from multiple places and provide that information back out to those people who needed it. What Starburst has allowed us to do is to put all of our data into the cloud and to put a high power query capability on top. That powers dashboards, powers AI, and powers extracts of information that can be used by clinicians to improve care. Clinicians who want to have simple access to the right information at the right time. And we have people who are doing research, people who might be want to understand the effect of COVID on particular cohorts of patients. And they have much more technical skills and might use uh, a data language like SQL to query the data uh, and to collect information that can help them improve their research. Security is obviously our paramount concern. If we don't get security right, then everything else has to stop. The data that we store is incredibly sensitive. It's both personal and important for people to keep confidential. And our platform can support that by anonymizing the data in a secure, approved way so that people can perform their research and uh, get the information they need, but without compromising any patient's confidentiality. Particularly what Starburst is able to provide is the individual row level and column level filtering that means users are only allowed to see the rows of information and the columns that they are entitled to see under the contracts and laws that we have with them. The sudden need for extra healthcare information when COVID pandemic needed uh, analyzing uh, scaling suddenly changed overnight. 
COVID really has demonstrated how important it is to not just have the right data, but to have it quickly. If you uh, find something out uh, a week ago, then already it might be out of date. And uh, as you point out, the new strain of, of coronavirus has really e emphasised how quickly uh, healthcare uh, data can, can move. And Starburst and our cloud provider have been able to really enable that and do it cost effectively. One of the, the things that we've been looking at most recently, which is, is really Really exciting is not just what coronavirus uh, is doing itself but what the aftershocks of coronavirus are on the rest of the healthcare system because so many people were nervous to go into hospital and visit their doctor while coronavirus has been around by analyzing all of the data that we have we're able to understand the impacts and the reasons that people visit uh, or don't visit their doctor and change the services that are being provided by the healthcare professionals so that they can uh, persuade people to come back to, to be treated uh, and improve the chances of non-COVID patients who've been affected by the, the pandemic in 2020. I hope you enjoyed learning about EMIS and their X Analytics platform. I can't imagine a better use case for X Analytics than serving healthcare professionals, providing more timely and accurate data to improve patient outcomes. So my question for you is, what use cases could be solved in your own business? Could you more quickly interpret, predict, and pattern new customer behavior, bring greater accuracy and transparency to your decisions, or meet legal and regulatory requirements more efficiently? What if you could quickly harness patient data and aggregate it with other data sources, marry contact tracing and spatial data to assess exposure risk, quickly identify new hacker patterns and train new models. What if you could X? So now we get into the final part of the talk. How do you build an X analytics architecture? Well, it starts by modernizing your existing data architecture. Gartner likes to talk about the practical logical data warehouse which is a delineation between known and unknown questions and known and unknown data, and then applying the right technologies to those different types of categories. And the short answer is that there is no one tool for every solution. In fact, the great Mike Stonebreaker has said on many occasions, there is no one size fits all database. Now, the old way is to try to move all of your data into one single data source, and you do that by combining semi-structured and structured data with a variety of ETL processes and ultimately ingesting that into a single database, what people call a single source of truth. The new way that we find more and more customers doing is implementing actually a single point of access instead, and then accessing the data where it lives. So now you have your range of data consumers, whether they're data scientists, marketers, finance professionals, or other types of data analysts, able to access data within the entire organization, breaking down data silos, and providing more holistic analysis of the business. Secondly, as you're creating this new architecture, you wanna create optionality as you go. We think that there are three ways you can do that. You can first and foremost embrace storage and compute separation. This is part of what the public cloud brings to bear, and it's the ability to scale up and scale down the compute resources that you have as needed and leave all of your data in the lowest cost possible storage option. This gives you tremendous control over cost and performance because you can scale up and down and pay for what you use. Secondly, use open data formats wherever you can. This is the lasting legacy of Hadoop. It brought us ORC file, Parquet, Avro, and other open source file formats that allow interoperability with a variety of tools. For example, you can use Spark to train a machine learning model on the same data that you're using Starburst to query that data and perform ad hoc SQL and BI. Columnar data types, like the ones I mentioned, provide better performance. That's exactly why ORC and Parquet exist. And lastly, these file formats avoid vendor lock-in. The third piece is to try to create a data consumption layer. And that's exactly what we do for our customers by using Starburst as this abstraction layer above all of the different data sources that you have. This makes those data sources portable and you can now move them around at your own pace. You may start with a traditional data warehouse on-prem, maybe a traditional data lake in Hadoop, and you may slowly start to migrate to a cloud data warehouse and a cloud data lake. And as you do that, you wanna be able to maintain a single point of access so that your end users are not disrupted 
by that data movement going on behind the scenes. Lastly, you want to prioritize connectivity. And at the end of the day, we like to think of ourselves as a consumption layer above all the data sources that you have. And in order to connect to these various data sources, those connectors are really critical. Starburst provides connectors to over 40 different data sources today, allowing you to, again, access the data where it lives, whether that's a data lake, a traditional relational database, a NoSQL database, or even something like Kafka for streaming data. So ultimately, X Analytics provides fast access to core data with the data warehouse, fast access to all other data, including new data for ad hoc analytics, the ability to join data from multiple data sources, and to be able to optimize price performance while serving urgent data access needs. Ultimately, you're able to improve time to insight and accelerate your digital transformation. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that Starburst helps companies achieve exactly this. And we do this by harnessing the power of the Open Source Trino project, a distributed query engine. Starburst makes it easy for companies like Comcast, Zalando, Condé Nast to run fast queries across distributed data sets, giving their data consumers powerful combinations of fresh data to drive critical decisions. If you want to help your organization become more data-driven, feel free to reach out to me to set up a conversation. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to speaking with you. Take care. Folks, we are pleased to be joined by Daniel Abadi. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And you know, such are the trials and tribulations of virtual conferences, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give you a quick introduction. Uh, Daniel is a Darnell Canal Professor of Computer Science at the University of Maryland and is Chief Scientist at Starburst Data and holds a PhD in Computer Science from MIT. Um, Daniel, we really look forward to uh, your views, your perspectives, and your knowledge of X analytics and and all that good stuff. Thank you for joining us. We really we're really happy you're able to to tune in and join us. Uh, no problem. Uh, let me just uh, sorry I just uh, get this the share um, started here. It so goes the wrong one. The data so here. This is the one. This is the one. Okay, right here. Okay. Great, yeah, so thank you for the introduction, Joe. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, I, I'm, I serve both, I, I have two hats, I guess. I, I, uh, uh, I work at the University of Maryland. I've been here for three years. Before here, I was uh, at, at Yale University for nine years um, as professor of computer science. Uh, and uh, most of the research that I do is in distributed uh, and scalable database systems, both transactional and analytical. Uh, and I also serve as a chief scientist at Starburst, uh, who's, uh, um, whose work I'm, I'm here to present today. So, uh, so let me just jump into it. Um, so you already saw the video. Um, so what I thought I would do uh, for the remaining time that we have in the session um, is to give you uh, a little bit of an example of, uh, 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 of you know, so that, you know the, 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 the basic ideas that Justin talked about in the video, um, they're at very high level. I thought it would be so good to use the remaining time to, to go a little bit more detail into exactly how the system works. Uh, and how we can uh, how the basic value proposition that Justin talked about is realized in practice. So let's let's jump into this example here. So let's say that we have a data warehouse, um, an old-fashioned data warehouse where uh, let's 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 say we're a retail company, so we're storing data a bit on transactions. You know, people buy stuff in our stores, um, and uh, and so whenever someone makes a purchase, we record it. Right, so we record the. You know, maybe the custom ID of the custom that bought it, uh, shown here in the bottom right of the screen, maybe the date and time they bought the item, maybe the product ID, uh, you know, what, the, what is it they bought, uh, the amount they bought it for, you know, and so on and so forth, you know, tax, whatever, you know, the cash register ID, you can imagine all kinds of different information that may show up uh, in, um, in a data warehouse that, which stores information about, about transactions of customer purchases in a, uh, in a particular set of stores. So let's say that we, we store all this information in a data warehouse, and it doesn't really matter what, what, you know, what the database system is that we're using, but let's say the Teradata, for example, that's a you know, very famous sort of widely used uh, data warehousing software. Um, so, so we have a you know, very nice big data warehouse, uh, Teradata data warehouse with all this information in it. And now, uh, separately, let's say that we have a separate database which has sort of information on the, on the loyalty program. Uh, so, uh, so this particular company, this retail company, um, 
in addition to storing information about transactions, they also have information about the particular customers, right? So when they get a loyalty ID card or a credit card or um, you know uh, RFID cards, you know, so they have some way to sort of uh, get information about particular customers. Uh, and so uh, let's assume that information is in a say you know in a, in a separate data database. You know, in many cases it can be in the same data warehouse, and in many cases it's not. And depending on privacy laws or depending on particular constraints in the organization, it may be stored in a separate database. So in this example, let's say it's stored in a separate database, the MySQL database. Information about the customers, their names, uh, maybe their social uh, network information, what tw Twitter ID they have, and, and so on and, and so forth. Stored in a separate database system. Uh, and then uh, let's say we have, uh, you know, and, and you know, in many cases, you know, these these uh, these systems are separate from each other. I have this dotted line here in the middle of the screen, so indicating that, you know, uh, you know, ideally it could be all in one system. But in many cases, not only are stored in separate systems, but also sort of have certain sort of organizational constraints, that, which make it a little bit non-trivial for one uh, to access the data in one database from the other database, and, and or vice versa. And I'll continue this example. Let's say also that this particular retail company also has a data science team which is sort of doing work uh, on understanding what's going on in the social sphere, I guess, right? So on the different social networks, Twitter, Facebook, and so on, you know, they're sort of keeping track of who's mentioning uh, our products, right? So, you know, that, so they, whatever, whatever technology they're using to, to, to go through this data, but they're going through social networks and they're extracting mentions and other important information about customers or people, users out there, which are mentioning information about the products sold by this particular company. Whether the positive or the negative doesn't matter, but they're just they're storing them in a in a, in, a um, in, um, in some kind of data store somewhere. And in this example, they're storing it in a, in in the cloud in the AWS data lake. And that just happens to be the um, the technology which is which was preferred by the data scientist team that uh, is doing the social network analysis. So now we have one organization. We have three different data sets, and they're separate from each other in separate databases. One's in the cloud, one's on premise, um, you know, but they're all there, there are just sort of three different data sets. And so in practice, you know, sort of what we want to do is we want to sort of drop the boundary. That's why now on this slide, I have these sort of these uh, black dotted lines uh, separating these database systems from each other, indicating that certain sort of, you know, many organizations that make it non trivial for one database to one uses a one database to access data in a different database. But you do have, we do have increasingly now, we do have uh, uh, philosophies like data mesh and so on that sort of do remove these barriers, right? So they make it possible for users of one database to access another database. But you still have a data store in separate database systems, right? So you have a, a data warehouse somewhere, we have a database somewhere, we have a data lake here in the cloud, but right? they're still stored in separate locations, even though they're all, the data itself is very relevant, you know, they're all sort of related data. You know, the, the same customers are speaking about the, the products that they're buying, yet they're stored in different particular locations. So, um, so what would we do? Now let's, let's say one of, you know, let's say, you know, a customer calls up uh, a particular call center about a purchase that they made, um, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could put together all the, you know, when we're talking to this customer, wouldn't it be nice to the agent talking to this customer to be aware of all the different things we know about that particular customer, in particular, what products they bought and, you know, what, you know, their name and so on that, that we know from their customer loyalty information, and also what they've been saying about, uh, about the products that they bought, and in particular, you know, what's their influence, are they sort of an influential person or, or not such a big influential person in, 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 the, in the social sphere, sphere that we may sort of as an agent, we may sort of treat the customer differently um, or choose a different set of um, uh, deals to present the customer mm -hmm. while we're talking to the customer based on this information, which is stored in separate locations. But to really want to combine them together uh, in a nice sort of unified interface to the agent that's speaking to the customers. But unfortunately, data right now is stored separately. So what do we do? So in the old days, what would happen is, um, do we try to, you know, the, a user would issue a query and then we'd sort of use query federation or, or virtualization to try and combine this data together on the fly. So what happened is that the query, we would sort of send, uh, uh, so, you know, this data, the, the query access, needs to access data in all places. Right? We want to know about the influence of the customer and what they bought and, and, um, and need to be all connected together to the loyalty information, right? So we need data from all three locations. So what would happen is the query would get divided into subqueries, uh, which would then go to the different locations, right? So subquery one would go to the data warehouse, another subquery would go to the uh, to, uh, to, to MySQL database, and another one would go to, to, to say another database somewhere else. Um, and what would happen then is that each you know each subquery would return a result back uh, to the original query, and then they would and then we would try to sort of aggregate the data on the fly to, across all these subqueries back to the end user. 
the problem is that this never really worked very well, right? So, you know, this you know, query federation technology has been around for two decades. Um, you know, I, my my PhD advisor back at MIT, uh, Mike Stonebrook, he had one of the first systems called Mary Poser. That was, I think, you know, before the turn of the century, even. I mean, this is more than 21 years ago uh, when when this technology started being developed. But the problem is it just never really works because the problem is, is that each database has a little, a, a little bit of a different dialect with the way they spoke to, um, uh, you know, even though they, they say they, they, they support SQL, but the version of SQL support by Teradata is a little bit different than the version of SQL supported by, uh, by Oracle and a little different than the version of SQL by SQL or Postgres. Um, and it's totally different than say, you know, than the, the data lake tools out there uh, which are very rarely, you know, a fully a SQL standard. Uh, so, you know, because the dialects were a little bit different, what happened is that uh, is that it ended up being sort of very difficult to uh, to be able to sort of, in a general way, to say how to divide a query into subqueries, which was compliant with a particular software being used by each particular system. Uh, so, and the query optimization process was really hard because you know the the way the Teradata runs queries is just so different from the way MySQL runs queries and so different from the way Oracle runs queries. And so having a general query interface, which sort of optimizes query execution and tries to sort of figure out uh, where the query should run and, and sort of, um, you know, and, and how to run those queries in an optimized fashion was just extremely difficult and never really worked very well. Um, so, uh, so as a result, uh, you know, the technology existed, but just never really kind of took off. Uh, but what, you know, what Starburst, you know, the, 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 uh, the company which you know which which shot, you saw the video uh, on from you know before I spoke, uh, you know what they're doing is that, you know, it's based on this sort of uh, Trino Presto technology, which is this new technology which which takes a very different approach to data federation and virtualization. So instead of taking a query and dividing the subqueries and trying to sort of send those to send, send those down all the way down to the SWOT databases and then trying to figure out optimization on the fly, which is extremely hard, instead what we've noted is that uh, is that the the now can the 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 ability to separate storage from query execution is, has really taken off from that past few years. The, the speed of networks, the ability to ship large amounts of data over the network has just has really improved over the last few years. And now it's really possible uh, to actually send, you know, even if, if to actually sort of store data separately from where the query is running. And you see this in sort of systems like, say, for example, Snowflake, where uh, where the storage layer is totally different from the query layer, and every single query has to read data from the storage layer to the query layer before it even starts running. So Starburst takes a similar approach. They sort of view these different systems, the MySQL system, the Teradata system, and the, and the Data Lake um, as, uh, as just really smart storage, and that's it. And so, uh, so rather than pushing subqueries down, instead, they pull, I mean, they, they do, do some push down, so basic selections and, and aggregations and things that sort of are pretty easy to, to push down and reduce the amount of data that's being sent over the network, they still do. But most data gets performed in the data consumption layer, right? So they sort of read data from these systems as if they were smart st storage, bring them into the, uh, the consumption layer, um, and then perform the query execution of the consumption layer. And so it's a very different approach to data federation, but it's a much more general approach. And it works in many more different types of systems. And that sort of al allowed, this allows, um, you know, as Justin mentioned, Starburst to, uh, to be able to, to provide solutions for many different types of companies. So I think, I think uh, the time, I think I'm supposed to go to 4.30, I need 10 minutes of questions. So I guess I'll stop here. Um, if, if there are questions, we can go ahead and do those now. If not, I can speak some more, but, uh, We'll leave, we'll leave these some, some time for questions. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, time. yeah, we have time. Yeah. Um, and uh, I urge our members of the audience, uh, uh, Daniel's here and, and he knows probably more about data warehousing and uh, data federation and analytics than uh, many people on the planet. So this is your opportunity to learn and uh, uh, please uh, put your questions in the, the uh, chat box uh, to the right, and uh, you know uh, Daniel is standing by to answer them. Um, and uh, I, I guess you know, Daniel, uh, there, there's so many products now in the marketplace. You know, we you know you talk about Oracle, and you talk about Terra Data, of course. Uh, um, you know, there's a there's so many. Uh, Different approaches, and there's a, there's the cloud databases as well. You know the the, the you know our data warehouses, you know Redshift and uh, all that good stuff. Uh, you know, uh, is it even possible? It seems like every time, you know, you come up with a solution to federate or bring this stuff together, new things pop up on the horizon, new 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 types of uh, 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 paradigms, if you will. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I think that's, um, you know, that's sort of why the old school data patient just didn't work, right? Because there's just so many systems being built all the time and they all, they just don't work the same way, right? So, um, so even if they do speak exactly the same, they write the same SQL language, like even if that was true, which they don't, uh, but even if it was true, the, you still have this problem of query optimization, which is that the way they run queries is still going to be different, right? So some systems store data column by column, some data store, store data row by row. Um, the, 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 you know, some systems are really good at hash joins, but really bad at merge joins. Some systems are really good at merge joins and not bad at hash joins. Some also do things in different orders. So like sort of, it's really hard to predict in advance sort of you know, how a particular system will, will process a query. And so if you're trying to push a query down to two different systems, uh, which run the query in different ways, there's just no way to be able to predict like how fast they're going to respond, right? So, so if you're not really going to respond, then you can't sort of predict when, I, when am I going to the next upgrade, the next place. Um, so it, it's really hard to plan in advance the whole, the whole sequence of query execution where you don't really have close knowledge of the way your system works. And as you said, as the number of systems expand, then it just becomes an even more just just a crazy difficult problem. And so all those old all those old data failures, they just they just they never really work very well. And it was it was just too hard of a problem in, in computer science. Um, so you know, so luckily we're lucky now that the network has gotten so good, we don't have to do it anymore, right? So the whole thing with Trino and Presto and Starburst and all those systems um, is that uh, we don't try to predict things in advance anymore. We can just sort of remove just on the fly treat the, the database system, the Oracle, the Teradata, or the MySQL, whatever it is, as a smart storage system, and that's it. And just extract entire block to data at once into the data consumption layer. Uh, and then once it's there, then it's just, then we have control of everything in, in the consumption layer, right? And so we can run and create execution the way we want to run it, knowing full well how we build our own operators and how we build our own uh, interface SQL standard. Um, and, uh, and we're able to sort of um, just sort of in a more uniform and, and more predictability, be able to, to run uh, query processing. So it's just, it's a very, um, it's a much more general approach, which is really important in, in modern times, as you mentioned, Joe, uh, as the as just the number of systems out there are, are just expanding so rapidly. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you've done a lot of work in the Hadoop space. Um, you know about uh, data lakes and, uh, and, and uh, uh, that area as well. And it seems the emphasis has been shifting to uh, real-time uh, data as it's being created the traditional role of the data warehouse, however, has been more of an archival or a historical, um, you know, how's, how's this playing out? How's this changing? I mean, the way I see it is the data mesh is really, making, really changing things, right? So, um, you know, the data lake, the way I see it is, is, you know, not that different than the data warehouse, right? It's still all in one place, right? So you're still sort of taking all your data and moving it to one place. And you know that causes scalability problems for for the organization of an, of an enterprise, which is you know that sort of you know once you have to put data in one place, you just have one sort of one team, one central team within that organization, all designed, all sort of in, sort of in charge of maintaining that data lake or that data warehouse um, in that one location, and and that's not sort of an ideal organizational infrastructure in, in organizational practice because then you know anytime you want to add new data to the data lake or to the data warehouse. You have this, you know, this team of 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 you know, of uh, IT guys and white coats, which sort of decide whether the data is worthy of going into this new data lake data warehouse. Um, and you know, and it's sort of uh, and, you, and once it goes there, you have to figure out where it should be. You know, to figure out, you know, is it going to be in, in the US or Europe? And you know, it's sort of you only see sort of um, you know you know, sort of multi-continent types of uh, of of solutions uh, in, in in data lake technology. So, uh, so you end up sort of with data sort of, you know, in a central location, which sort of just slows down access to, to availability of that data. So the whole thing with the data mesh, this, this sort of new idea, is that we, we get allow each team sort of be in charge of their own data set, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll allow do, uh, each, you know, each domain within an enterprise to be specialty of their own domain, store data the way they want to store data, wherever they want to store it, whether it's a cloud, whether it's on premise, whether it's in, in Europe, whether it's in America, whether it's in Asia, wherever they want to store it, it's great. You just store it wherever, wherever, where it's supposed to be, um, and then just at, uh, um, uh, and then we'll just at, the, at, at query time, we'll just bring all that data together um, and um, uh, and query it at runtime, no matter where, where you know, no matter, reach out to where it is and sort of bring it back into into um, the data consumption layer and run query processing there. So if you have that valuable customer uh, calling into the call center. Uh... Uh, right away, they, they have access to uh, the right. history, the customer history you as well as the current yeah. issue. Right. If they're valuable, if they're if they're a highly influential customer, uh, that you know, 
you know, that has a lot of people following them. You want to make sure that <laughs> you want to screw it up, you know, when you talk to them, yeah, you yeah. that, uh, that, that you take care of them um, in, in an appropriate way, assuming that they're being reasonable. Um, and uh, um, and that you need to have that, you know, sort of without barriers, and, you know, as soon as they're talk, calling up, you want to have the information at the fingertips. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Daniel, well, our, our time is up, and but I want to thank you very much. Uh, it's been great that you were able to, to join us. You know, we we really appreciate you being able to uh, spend the time and and uh, you know talk to us about uh, the trends you're this, you're seeing, the trends uh, shaping the uh, market. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, anytime, of course. <laughs>